And um, I'm detailed to as the uh, director of the Defense Cybercrime Institute. So I'm here recruiting uh, talented people to do research and development for forensics tools. Okay, what I'm going to do here, um, uh, this is the fourth Meet the Fed panel. It's not kind of annual. Uh, we've been busy the last three years, and we haven't had a panel for the last three years. Um, the last one we had, I don't know how many of you were here for the last Meet the Fed panel that was in the tent on the roof. That was, uh, that was an interesting experience. It was about 114 degrees outside. Uh, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, it was 98 degrees in the tent, and I'm going, who in their right mind would ever come to a panel you know, on, in Las Vegas on a Saturday afternoon you know, in that kind of weather? And uh, I think we had about 1,200 people in that tent. So that just shows you have, uh, shows a lack of good judgment on your part. Um, so let me rescind that. You could not work for the government. Well, maybe you could. Less than 500. Um, what, what, what we're here for, the reason the feds are here, uh, it, it, and our objective for having this Meet the Fed panel is kind of threefold. Um, if you've crossed the line, how many of you have crossed the line and hacked somebody's system? I think I can raise my hand. Too. <laughs> okay. Well, I need you. <laughs> but arrest that guy in the second uh, row. Uh, I'm in illegally, Robert. Um, <laughs> shit, the last time everybody, I had everybody stand up, and I said, if you've never hacked a system, sit down. Half the system, half the guys sat down, and we took pictures of all the rest. You know, <laughs> and, and you guys didn't fall for it this time. So anyway. If, if, if you them? have crossed that line, I, so. uh, I want to let you know that we're, we're working together and we are sharing information and we will catch you and we will ruin your life. That's not a good thing. So, so, so the, if you haven't stepped over that line, please don't. First off, we've got enough noise. If, if you haven't noticed, there is a global war on terrorism and, and all the intrusions that we see most of them are just noise that we that take valuable resources away from the global war on terrorism and and other really significant things that we're trying to do it takes those resources away from that uh, and if you haven't crossed that line we're we in the government are looking for good talented people uh, we need a lot of help be careful there uh, we always need a steady flow of talented people. I'll get to questions in a second because I don't know if I want to listen to you or not. <laughs> so um, so that, that's kind of our, uh, our agenda here and why we're here. So what I wanted to do is kind of start at the far end and, and introduce uh, who's on the panel. Each person will uh, later on get a, a one, two minute opening statement and then we're just going to open it up to questions from you guys. Uh, also, just some random thoughts. After this is over, uh, at uh, 2 o'clock, I'm in the dunk tank. Well, <laughs> so, so when Jeff, when Jeff called and said, you know, I don't know how to ask you this, but it would really be cool if we could dunk a Fed, you know. <laughs> and, and it's not like I mean, ha ain't been dunked before, you know. So uh, I said, well, where's the money go? He said, EFF. I said, hell no. So, <laughs> so, so what I did, we, we negotiated. And the money for the dunk tank will go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So if you want to support a good charity, okay? Yeah. Also, uh, I do have a limited number. These are embroidered, okay? Uh -huh. Okay? 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 All right. All right. All right, so limited number of these, and it's uh, forty-nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at the far end is uh, Andy Freed. He's a senior special agent with the uh, Treasury Inspector General. Everybody loves those guys for tax administration, and he does system intrusions there. Uh, he's been with uh, Treasury for sixteen years now, uh, and before that, I met Andy back in probably 1986, 87. He was still working for uh, Kennedy Space Flight Center. Uh, and, and just a side note, he wrote all the forensics tools that everybody in the law enforcement community used internationally until about 1993. 
Then we tested the tools and found out that they weren't worth a shit. So, uh, next is Mike Jacobs. Mike Jacobs uh, is a retired Fed. Uh, Mike joined uh, SRA in October of 2002 as a senior advisor, uh, but his real job as a Fed uh, was that he was the uh, director of uh, uh, information assurance for NSA. So uh, lots of, I'm not going to go through all the awards that he's won, but w what was really neat was he was also the mayor of College Park for four years. And he was on the uh, city council there for 14 years. So not only is he a Fed, but he was a politician. So you really ought to hate him and the IRS guy. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Uh, next in line is Ovi Carroll. Ovi Carroll is a special agent in charge of the computer crime unit uh, for the U.S. Postal Service. So, you know, anybody who's using email, he's going to run a case on you because they just don't like email. Um, <laughs> he's got an extensive background, was a, uh, an OSI, Air Force OSI agent for about 18 years before retiring and uh, going to uh, U.S. Postal Service. Don't make him angry. <laughs> yeah, uh, when we, you know, most agents, when you travel today, you travel armed. They don't let postal service guys travel <laughs> armed. <laughs> and then uh, yesterday, I, I met Robert Marr Sr. Um, uh, I've met him a couple of times, you know, just in passing, going up and introducing myself, and he sure to hell didn't remember me. So yesterday, I happened to meet him up when I was picking up the speaker badges. And uh, he said, well, do I know you? And I said, no, you really, I've met you a couple times, but I'm sure you don't remember me. But the fact is, I was the case agent on your son's case. So, <laughs> so I know your son a little bit better than I know you. So he's agreed to sit in on the panel, but he's not allowed to talk. <laughs> uh, just immediately to my left is uh, Alvin Wallace. Alvin Wallace is a uh, supervisory special agent with the uh, Air Force Office Special Investigations, and he's a special agent in charge uh, at Debt 253 in San Antonio, which is co-located with the Air Force Information Warfare Information Operations uh, Center. Um, he's had an extensive background. Uh, we worked together as a computer crime investigator way back in 1988. Uh, he worked uh, with me at the Defense Computer Forensics Lab, so he's got a very, he, you know, so if you've got technical questions, we're going to give them to uh, Alvin. Uh, one guy is on his way. It's the FBI. They're always late. Uh, <laughs> Special Agent Tim Huff. Uh, he's, he's in a cab. He's at the airport, and he's on his way over, and they're going to they're gonna bring him in as soon as he gets here. Uh, he has a, 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 a BS. Uh, in computer science from Jacksonville University and was a U.S. Naval officer uh, from 85 to 96 before joining the FBI and now he's part of the FBI uh, uh, computer analysis response team. So hopefully uh, Tim will be here pretty soon. So at this point what we do is we'll start at the far end with Andy, uh, let everybody take a, a, a two or three minute opening statement and then we're uh, just going to open it up to you guys for questions. Uh, as he said, my name is Andrew Freed. I'm a senior special agent with uh, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. I already said that, Andy. <laughs> and, so, so that we can't. For, uh, <laughs> uh, basically, one of the things that's unique about our organization, for those of you who don't know who we are, we're actually like the IRS internal security. Uh, the, everybody here pay their taxes that aren't foreign? Okay, if you haven't paid your taxes, please raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can assure you're you a liar, but that was pretty good. <laughs> I can assure you they don't give us any professional discounts either, unfortunately. Uh, one of the unique things about our organization is we're physically co-located with the IRS Computer Security Incident Response Center. So we have a really good working relationship where we basically both work together at doing proactive, proactive testing as well as reactive uh, cases to situations. Uh, we're located out of uh, Lanham, Maryland, and basically there's about seven of us that are in this squad, and we refer to the squad as the System Intrusion and Network Attack Response Team, or CINART. It sounded kind of like space trucky, so we kind of liked it. Uh, basically, um, 
We have done a lot of work with some of the people out here. It's nice to see uh, a face with a port number that I've seen on our uh, IDS. Thank you very much. Uh, but we actually have worked with a number of you all. We've had some of the people come up and say, always wanted to attack a Fed system. And we've given permission to do it with a couple of ground rules. Uh, so we're not actually anti-hackers and we're not anti-computer uh, people. In fact, this is my sixth year here. I enjoy the people here. I enjoy being here. And I'll certainly uh, be willing to talk to anybody that wants to talk to us after the presentation. Thanks, Andy. I'm Mike Jacobs. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for the, about 10 years, I avoided judiciously coming here uh, for obvious reasons. However, now that I'm retired, uh, it's really been an enjoyable couple of days meeting with you. And during my time as the Director of Information Assurance at NSA, I often told my folks that uh, the hacker community is probably our ally. Uh, and we need to pay attention to what they're doing out there. We can learn from what they're doing out there. <laughs> that said, stay within the law. Now, I'd like to ask you all to stand for a moment. <laughs> come on, come on, I mean, come it's on, not that come early on, in the day. Man. A little test. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on. Everybody who... Uh... <laughs> you know, for years... Um, DEFCON has run the Spot the Fed um, contest, if you will. I'd like to suggest that there's another contest that they might start next year. It's called Spot the FIO. So all of you who are not foreign intelligence officers, sit down. <laughs> Caught a couple. Playing defense is often more difficult than playing offense. And indeed, in my 38 years of playing defense, uh, we were often outsmarted by those using the same techniques, technology, and analytical processes because they were just slightly better at playing offense. I would urge you to take your talents, your intellect, your curiosity, and your aggressiveness and play defense. Thanks. By the way, <laughs> this is fifty nine ninety five. <laughs> Ovi, wow, I came in empty handed. Uh, as he said, I work for the Postal Inspector General's Office. We do all the computer intrusion and computer forensics for the uh, Postal IG. It's pretty simple. I didn't, uh, I didn't bring any trinkets, but I tell you what I'll do is uh, whoever is the goon that's running the dunk tank, whoever donates the must, most money to dunk. <laughs> Wait, I owe you a nickel. Yeah. <laughs> whoever donates the most money to we dunk Jim, dunk tank. yeah, that's right, to, uh, to Jim Christie, uh, I'll give him the shirt off my back, the one right here. How's that? We really don't work well together. Do we? <laughs> I'm primarily here to say no comment. <laughs> but I'd like to suppress a few rumors that I have heard about me and the others by saying that I have never been indicted for a felony, well, in the United States. <laughs> Recently. And, <laughs> yeah, right. Recently. You and you convicted. Is, jo is, is John Ashcroft here today? <laughs> In okay, I've said enough. <laughs> Alvin. Uh, as Jim said, I am an Air Force OSI agent. The Air Force realized early on, as many of the people in this room did, that the computers were very important. Uh, to the way society and information was going to flow in the future. The OSI dis established a computer crime investigative program back in 1978. Uh, some of the best computer crime investigators and other federal agencies all came and had their start in the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And we're still actively recruiting because while we are one of the best 
and one of the best training grounds, we seem to have a retention problem thanks to industry out there and postal and other people like that. So we would like to encourage everyone out there, I mean, the Department of Defense realizes how important computers are to the flow of information and for defending the United States. And we're always on the lookout for good people. And, and what are you going to do to them when you find them? Well, we're going to pay them, and we're going to pay them well. And there are also After programs, the lobotomy. And there are also some programs that will allow for the, re the um, relief of certain uh, student loan debts if you stay as a uh, civilian employee for a certain period of time. I didn't have room for... Uh, T-shirts, as the rest of them do, but I do have a few coins. Well, I'll let Mr. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I lost one already. Sorry. <laughs> okay. At this point, uh, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. But please speak loud, because you know when we repeat your question, we're going to twist it up. <laughs> yes, sir. Very, very much so. It's active. It's not necessarily very easy to find, but I assure you it does exist reasonably large. I mean, it's not hundreds and hundreds or something like that, but it's dozens. And uh, it's effective in the sense, both in the sense, it gives the people a very interesting thing to do for the few, few years that they need it going through college. But also, it provides an important method of recruitment. Just as my buddy over here, uh, as I'm talking about, recruitment is very important and rather difficult for a number of reasons, including, of course, the commercial end of the business. There, there, just, are, there are just two last federally year, sponsored last programs. Week. There, are, there are two federally sponsored right. programs, uh, loosely uh, referred to as the Cyber Corps. One is a Department of Defense program, which is the one that NSA manages. That's what I was thinking. And the other one is managed by the National Science Foundation. It's considerably larger. Uh, there are today four or five hundred uh, student um, scholarships at work uh, at about uh, 50 different universities across the country. And yeah, you go to the National Science Foundation's uh, homepage and you'll find it. Yeah, just last week, uh, Tulsa University hosted the uh, Cyber Corps uh, 2004 Symposium. And uh, there was a job fair. Uh, most of the uh, law enforcement, federal law enforcement agencies were there recruiting. I, I got uh, 52 uh, resumes. These are talented people, both uh, postgraduate and uh, uh, graduate level. Uh, 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 you know, and I, I got to tell you that we went back to our bosses and we said, hi, doing Tim, this is Tim Huff, FBI. We've already introduced you. Okay. you. They're clapping for you now. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I went back, and we have seven uh, vacancies right now, civil service vacancies. Uh, they were advertised at the GS-13 level. Uh, these guys coming out of Cyber Corps don't qualify for a GS-13. So... Uh, we went back and we're rewriting the position descriptions and we're going to re-advertise them so we can get these uh, guys that have uh, gone through forensics training, IA training, uh, to bring them on to, uh, with law enforcement. And also, those of you who have already gotten your degree and you're saddled with a large amount of student loans, a program was started about two years ago to try and recruit people into the federal service. And if you go out to OPM.gov, each agency is implementing it differently, but you can have up to 70, 75 percent of your student loans forgiven based on government service within, within the GS. Do we have any Cyber Corps students here? Okay. Um, Tim, would you like to make an opening statement? Everybody's, we're in the question and answer. Everybody's had a couple of minutes to make an opening statement, so now it's your turn in the barrel. You already went over the bios and stuff, right? Yes. There's not much more to say. Uh, I've been doing uh, computer forensics now for uh, seven years. I've been an agent for eight years. Uh, I've been based out of the Pittsburgh office for the first six years in the Bureau, and now I'm at uh, Quantico, and I'm coordinating uh, all the forensic activities for the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, other than that, that's, I'll sit and listen for a little bit, cool. and now I'll speak up. 
Actually, the uh, airline not only made me late by about three hours, they also lost my luggage. So <laughs> I intended on showing up on, in a shirt that actually said FBI on it, and I had this T-shirt that I wear when I travel. So my apologies. Yes, sir. I've got two quick questions to go around. First one, since we've got a couple of NSA people here, you guys know about the Pueblo, right? Yes. What? Uh, Pueblo. Pueblo. Oh? The city in Colorado. If you have the right to one, if that's in fact no requirement for employment uh, or for contract services or whatever, aren't you afraid that you're limiting yourself to the one of you? Are you asking, are you asking whether it's yeah. difficult to be employed if you're across the line? Well, most, most of the federal law enforcement agencies require you to have a clearance. So depending on what in that clearance and that background investigation, uh, they're going to look at when you broke the law. And, you know, everybody's broken the law probably during their lifetime, so, except me. <laughs> so um, it, it depends on when you did it. If you want a job, if you were breaking the law yesterday and now you want to come to work for the government tomorrow, the chances are we're not going to select you because there's a whole lot of talented people that haven't crossed over that line in, let's say, the last five, seven, eight years. So if you had a choice, would you want someone who, well, I'm, not, I'm not asking the wrong audience. <laughs> would you guys want somebody? <laughs> so, so, so it depends when you did it, what the severity of it, of the crime was, things like that. So it's, it, you know, everything is taken on a case by case. Well, getting caught isn't exactly uh, something you gotta, you know, look at it's if we have an investigation on you because of your activities i have uh can't occasion to I can't hear you. i've had uh, some investigative experience with uh, a couple people that have gone on and done certain activities and they didn't decide to charge them because basically they wanted to look at them a little bit more and uh they went a couple years and now they've tried to get a legitimate job and and now applied for security clearance and they're not going to get it because we've got this history of them from two, three, four, five years back that we've shown that they have actually intruded upon certain areas. Just because they don't have anything charges brought against you doesn't mean there isn't some kind of file on you of your activities. Well, that's, that's, that's good for the military. Law enforcement, I don't think, is going to go that far. And, and working with someone and hiring them are two different things. We'll work with anybody. And, and I think we may not pay you. Yeah. <laughs> the term might be used. But, yeah. Could you stand up and project for everybody? Yeah, freedom of information acts are taken very seriously by any government organizations. We all have huge bureaucracies set up to answer them. If you request information from an organization that does hold that information, you will get a response. Of course. Yeah. Uh, did okay, wait. You, you, already, you already had your turn, sir. Have, right here. Stand up, would you please? That's an agency by agency uh, decision. I can tell you that Jim and I were both at the Defense Computer Forensic Lab at the same time, and we brought on an enormous number of people who had no clearances prior to the fact that they're applying for the job, both as government workers and as contractors working on the contract. The Kids right out of college, and no clearance. 
you know, we get them an interim clearance, you know, and, and that limits what they're working on until their clearance is adjudicated. But we took it. And that's typically a thing. I mean, if it's a contractor's position, it's nor if it's a government position, you'll be you should be considered as long as you're able to get a clearance. If the contractors often are worried about the bottom line, so if they bring you on with no clearance right now, it takes about 18 months to get you a full up top secret clearance. More than fifty thousand dollars, and, it, it, and it's a fifty thousand dollar cost. So, looking at you and an, uh, you and an equally qualified person who has the clearance already in hand, puts you at a disadvantage. Well, you know, there, it is true that, you know, even the contractor community would prefer to hire people with clearances, but uh, you can come and get my business card afterwards. We hire, we hire people without clearances. Right. <laughs> not anymore. I'm not in that business anymore. I'm a contractor. Yes, sir. White shirt. <laughs> Did you attack? Yeah. File to all of them. Which one did you attack? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would start with. <laughs> yeah. There, there are some individuals who basically have blanketed the federal law enforcement organizations requesting information about whether or not they have a file related to them. And they will come back with an answer of no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I couldn't hear it either. Well, I think the original question was if the private sector will pay me $100,000 to eat donuts and sit at home, what's the government going to offer? Uh, the federal government, you, the, the, the salaries are beginning to get more competitive with the private sector. You can go out. No, they have made special considerations for IT. Um, at the CIO level, they're, they're at the CIO level of different organizations, they're starting to come out with some new programs. Uh, there is stability in working for the federal government. The leave is typically better than the leave that you'd get in the private sector. Uh, and you're serving your country. There's things that there are advantages to it, but then again, there are disadvantages to the bottom line. And if you're that interested in donuts, uh, the federal law enforcement gets free donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I would like I would like to shift the grounds of the discussion by just a bit because we're hearing about people who have difficulty finding jobs because they don't have clearances or it takes them too long to get them. As an employee of whatever it is, whatever organization it is that I work for, I go through a polygraph every few years. I think it's every three normally, but uh, let me tell you the questions from the last, and answers from the last polygraph exam that I went through. First was, sir, have you ever committed espionage? Uh, yes. <laughs> have you ever committed sabotage? Um, yes. <laughs> have you ever d deliberately destroyed a piece of computing equipment? Uh, yes. <laughs> now, there, w there was some further discussion with the polygraph examiner, but basically that was the entire content of the po of the uh, polygraph examination. And I think you can understand that some jobs that pe and some activities that people engage in are occasionally pretty damn strange. And I don't necessarily have much in common with the people on the right in that kind of thing. And that story just sits as it was. Funny, if you like. <laughs> All the way in the back. No, yep. Real loud. Can't, can't. What, what is your opinion on the Patriot Act? 
Of what? <laughs> Our opinion of the Patriot Act. Oh, my, yeah, right. Oh. Andy, we'll start down your end. <laughs> no comment. I think that Mr. Ashcroft is taking attendance at this uh, particular forum. <laughs> Keep in mind that the Patriot Act was enacted after a catastrophic event. Similar reactions can occur in this government, despite the fact that we are a nation of freedoms, after any catastrophic event. So if in cyberspace catastrophic events begin to occur, similar acts can be enacted. Um, there are things about the Patriot Act that personally disturb me in terms of individual freedoms. However, they are understandable in the context of the times we live in. And so further activity in other areas that can precipitate the same sort of response from the Congress further risks our freedoms. Can I add something to that a little bit? Please. Just because the Patriot Act is out there doesn't mean every judge out there is going to give you carte blanche to go out and do all these things that are possible. It takes a stack of justification and a great deal of investigation beforehand in many cases to get permission to do the things that the Patriot Act does ask or, or make available. So just because the law is there doesn't mean that all of a sudden we're tapping everybody's phones and we're doing all these things. We just don't have the manpower or the ability. We don't have the, the, the need to do that. We're looking at the people that are, are the serious bad guys. The people on the fringes, they're on the fringes. Right now, our, uh, for the FBI, the importance is international domestic terrorism. And that's right up there. Uh, Patriot Act does apply to a lot of those things. But we've got to do our homework first to get justification to say, this really needs to be done. And the judges out there, they're real hard asses about that sort of stuff. You know, they just don't say, OK, you're an agent, you get it. No, they look at it, they read it, they question. and. Sometimes they deny it. They say, you don't have enough information. So it's, it's just not a big open book for us. And I guess the last thing I'd like to add is, how many people out here, please raise your hand, have actually read the Patriot Act and seen right. what's written into it? And how many of those people actually think that it's impinging upon your personal privacy? And it, it's not quite as, it, it wasn't quite as many. But I mean, the Patriot Act does not do many of the things that the popular press has put forward and does not impinge on the freedoms that the popular press has always um, indicated that it does. I mean, it, does, it gives us some more flexibility, but it doesn't remove the probable cause from a law enforcement investigation. Probably fewer. <laughs> but their staffers read it. You know, privacy is always a balance between public safety and, 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 and privacy. And, you know, th that balance, depending on the world situation, is going to be an ebb and flow. So after a catastrophic, catastrophic event like 9-11, the pendulum swung the other way. You're going to see it go back, um, I'm sure. And then we'll have another event, and it'll go back again. Um, it's just the, it's the fact of life, and you vote for your, your senator and your congressman who enacted the law. So you guys have control. Uh, try this side. Red Hat. With what? Seymour's old boxes. What that is. I, I couldn't hear it, so I couldn't repeat it. Seymour, who? Oh. oh, what are we doing with them? What, yeah, I, I know. I, I know what we're talking. I know what you're talking about. I just didn't quite understand what you said. What are we doing with them? The job we're being paid to do. A GS-18 or above? No. Not anymore. <laughs> but at one time, yes. 
Okay, next to the last row, three back there. Yeah, you loud, please, because we can't hear you up here. Well, all, all, all I can tell you. I'm not going to put that shut I just know when I came up, came up to uh, a judge to do any kind of warrant, it was a stack of about an inch and a half worth of paper that we said, this is what we know so far, this is why we need this part of the Patriot Act enacted to go after this bad guy. And I can just basically say that many of the law enforcement and organizations have been very cautious in their uses of these and probably one of the reasons that very few have been turned have been denied is because they've done their homework and they've established the probable cause prior to requesting the judge to issue the warrants because the last thing you want as a special agent is to have to go back to your boss and explain to him that you went to a judge used his time used the goodwill of your organization for something that he didn't approve there's also a pretty good vetting process, so as it's going up the chain, if it's not going to stand the, the smell test, so to speak, it's not going to make it up to a judge, so that'll help. Yes, sir. Selective enforcement in which way? We invest. We investigate crimes, okay, and we bring this stuff up before the United States Attorney's Office. They decide who to prosecute. We don't make that decision. I don't have the choice. It's the it's the U.S. Attorney's Office that says arrest them or don't arrest them or indict them or not indict them. We just investigate the crime, bring the stuff up to the a uh, AUSA's office, and they make the decision whether they want to even take the case or not. So it's not in our hands whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What's your role, or should say, your agency's role, in the IRA of the way that I don't think anybody up here prosecutes. Right. That's they're the, they're the ones that make the decisions, as far as any kind of court action. We do the investigation. Yeah. Let me let me state that there's two basic mechanisms that we have to obtain information from an ISP. One is what we refer to as a 2703D order, and that has to go through the U.S. Attorney's Office and signed by a magistrate. And the second is a traditional search warrant, which also has to go through the U.S. Attorney's Office and be signed by a magistrate. We don't issue, in, under most circumstances, any other mechanism for obtaining that information. Now, being an inspector general shop, we do have the ability to issue an IG subpoena. But for the most part, since they're almost unenforceable, we usually opt to go through the U.S. Attorney's Office. In most cases, the ISP will not cooperate with law enforcement, even if they want to, until they receive a court order because it takes them off the hook for civil liability. So once again, if I want to go after you, there's other checks and balances between me and that process that have to be okayed by the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I think most of you don't understand something else about the federal system. When I got out of college, I was a street cop for five and a half years. And when you go out and you make an arrest, whatever that prosecutor is in that local jurisdiction gets that case in the morning and starts dealing with it. In the federal environment, it's very different. You work a case. You go to a U.S. Attorney's Office and they decide whether they're going to prosecute or not. Just because you broke the law, just because we can prove you broke the law, doesn't mean we'll get a prosecution. Each office within the country will have separate guidelines. So, for instance, when I was a special agent down in Central Florida and South Florida, you had two kinds of